It continues to do for one's own action or one's own karma is still is unwholesome. Right? Okay, I mean, this is why I say it's a big subject in the future. But anyway, now we come to the fifth one, which is very important, and this is also why I picked this subject as well. Not that remember, every morning, if you can remember, or before your meditation, if you keep these five in your heart, you somehow you'll find your meditation become very stable, because you have those, uh, what we call, almost like you have opened uh, the light already, you know. The fifth one is actually is the banya, mean the wisdom. Okay, let me just see what does it mean the wisdom here. I'm sure that everybody were after the wisdom. Even the most foolish person will say they still love, love wisdom. Am I right? Anyone tell you I don't want wisdom? That, that nobody will tell you that. Okay, but it depends on how you understand. <laughs> the wisdom, the word wisdom. But now, I'm not here to discuss this as a big subject, but at least have a more, just a very uh, succinct definition of wisdom, from a, at least from a Buddha perspective. Ultimately, what are they? Okay, Banya Vahoti, Uddaya Tha, no, Uddaya Atthaka Miniya, Banya Ya Samana Kato Ariya Ya Nipa, Nipedi Kaya Sama Dukkha Kaya Kaminiya Imina Ko Bikawe Banja Bataniyang Gani Di. Okay. So, what it is the fifth one, and, and he concludes that's a wisdom, and what it is wisdom, and this is what all these five is called the five activation, or you could simply say the five, uh, become a five motivation factors for you. What it is mean by the wisdom? Mm, say he is he ha, he is a wise because he possesses the wisdom that discerns arising and perishing, which is noble and nibedika. Maybe simply just translate as that will lead you to nibbana. Okay. In Chinese, just a jueze, jueze. But I know even Chinese jueze can be very confusing for a lot because Chinese jueze simply means you choose sometimes, but not in the Buddhist term. The word jueze here, you are able to be nibedita uh, actually directly relate to the Four Noble Truth that you kind of know you are in the truth of suffering, the truth of the original suffering. Uh, the truth for understanding the origin of suffering, the truth for abandoning the origin of suffering, and the truth of the path leading to the ending of the suffering. Right? So that's why it's called Jueze in Chinese. But you know, if you don't understand it correctly, <laughs> you, you probably define very differently. So anyway, here, maybe simply let's say, what does the wisdom mean? The wisdom to the Buddha, uh, firstly, he was saying, that you are able to discern, in other words, to see, right? To discern the arising and the going away. Okay. In Ch I will say Chinese a little bit later, just after this. And what? And this kind of arising and the going away is what? Is noble. Or you could simply say holy. <laughs> I don't like holy word, but you know the most noble one, and it will make you to nibbana, or maybe simply understand that will lead you to really lead you in the four noble truth. Okay. This is what we call by wisdom. Hello. Can you understand that? Okay. Simply just say. Okay, the fifth one, why I need to activate, in other words, me. Remember, there's a kind of the thing called a wisdom, and which is mean you're able to see the arising and ceasing. Okay. And this arising and ceasing is the best or the noble. Because later when you practice vipassana, you know what I'm talking. And the best. The best is not all oh, because I feel the earth. The best is not because I know the breath. Okay. The best is because you see the arising and ceasing. 
Don't worry, we would, we would be there if you can able to meditate in that way. And that, only that, is the most noble, or the, the one we simply say noble, and it's that is the, that the one that leads you to Nibbana, something like that. Okay, understand? Okay, this is what by the wisdom. Now, having said this, give you a little ex- uh, story, maybe easier. <clears throat> One of the very, 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 very famous story. I use many very, I don't know how many very, you know. But uh, the Sariputta, before he became the disciple, Sariputta as uh, one of the monks during the Buddha's time, uh, usually we call him as the, uh, what I call, the, the general of the Dhamma, you know, the general of the Dhamma. Uh, so, but what the reason he is called general? In other words, many reasons. But the the, ma- the main reason is he can explain the teachings very well. Okay, or you could say second to the Buddha. You could just simply say it that way. And what happened is that uh, before he was uh, really uh, kind of like become a monk or just really join the the Buddha the Buddhist uh, community, and uh, he met one of the the earliest, uh, I mean, the earliest, no, one of the monks who become the Arahant, uh, you know, the earliest one who become Arahant, the, the first five one, yeah. the first uh, five, one of them. And when he saw this monk, he was surprised by his comportment. That's why he approached and asked, I see you, have, you look very different. Uh, like very joyful, very serene, very calm. And I'd like to know who is your teacher. And then, of course, this monk, uh, as an arahant, but he's still very humble, he say, oh, my teacher is who? But then he said, what did your teacher talk to you? So, and then he say, uh, actually he asked, you know, how do you come in that kind of stage? He was very humble, he say. No, I, I still, I cannot explain very well, not like my teacher. Basically, then he, would, he asked him, but you still can explain something. So, then he said, oh, okay, I can tell you one of the words. Sometimes, do not think that the words, it doesn't work, it's very, very powerful. I, I would say that a little more. Let me just say the words first. And then, when, after when he, he hear the words, the Sariputta, at that time, he did, he, he, his name before he became a monk, he didn't call Sariputta, he was called Up- Upadisa. And then the Tissa, Upadisa, he, after hearing that uh, verse, he immediately became the saint. You know. The verse is said like this Ye Dhamma Hetu Papawa, Te Sang Hetung the Tagato Aha, Te Sang Jutyo Nirota, Ewang Wadi Mahasamano. Simply translate, it will say, all the Dhamma, here Dhamma refers to the phenomena, uh, arise due to the cause. Okay? There's some here don't target her. Because of that also, no, there's some je yo nirota. Or maybe simply just say, all the Dhamma arise that all the Dhamma has a cause to arise, and at the same time, it ceases. Okay. This is what my teacher always said, that's all. Now, you, when you hear this kind of thing, you think, oh, what wow, sounds very profound, that's it, you know. But when you practice now, you will start to close to that. Many things. One thing is, let's say, I give you very one of the very simple example. One thing is, say that we've been learned the inside meditation when you sit. Even though you, you don't necessarily close that, but you somehow know something similar to that. When you're sitting, you feel heaviness in your body, right? Is it all the time like that? No? And then the heaviness will go away. Then maybe you feel different things like tickling, say that, say that, tickling. And the tickling will go away. 
And then what happened? Say that maybe the heaviness come back. And then maybe after the heaviness come back, it become softer, right? In other words, you could just simply say soft, become soft, soft. Yeah, for people when they practice at that level, they will just understand, oh, this is heavy, this is tackling, this is soft. Even if they could do that, it's very wonderful. I'm going to explain that a little bit more later. But I want to explain you in regard to this mean, if you're able to meditate and meditate and meditate and meditate and meditate, and then your wisdom, when it builds up, you don't really only understand because of heaviness, because of softness, there's a softness, there's a heaviness, there's an itchiness, but you will understand it change, right? Everything is to you that time. It's just change. It become this, it become that, it become this, it become that, it become this, it become that, it become this, it become that. And then when that repeatedly, it doesn't have to be the same thing, but repeatedly. And sometimes you also know why it become this, why it become that, why it become this, why it become that. Let me tell you one why. Sometimes when it's heaviness, it can become itching, it's because for example, it's because, just say something, it's because if you can look inside clearly, then you'll find different things. Or sometimes it can be because it is, uh, when your mind is a little bit stronger, powerful, you find, oh, it's supposed to be soft, it's not just heavy, it becomes soft, right? So, there are a lot of causes there. Basically, I want to say, and you can, you know all this, that this is how when you start to understand it, changing 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 it. That time for you, everything you see, it just change. Okay. When you see that time, everything is a change. This is what we say. All the all the dharma, you know, arise. Now the difficult is to see actually. If the all the dharma is arise. There's a two way to explain it. One explain because the Dharma is arise, it will cease. But I don't explain it that way. I explain it actually the moment when it arises, it means the moment it ceases. If you want to talk about moment, here they didn't use the word moment. In other words, I mean, if you look at it grammatically, I even think it means what Dharma arise is what Dharma ceases. Well, in other words, I would say, if people who can only observe the Dhamma, the phenomena, Dhamma means the phenomena, like hardness is one of the phenomena, softness is one of the phenomena, itchiness is one of the phenomena, all this, they arise, it will cease, right? This is just one of the process you, you start to see. But when your meditation become, when you're able to meditate and become even stronger and more powerful, everything arise, just change to cease. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so because everything arises itself, it means it changes to cease. Supposing you see something arise, but now you don't, that time. After the process of seeing the arising and ceasing, and then you see just ceasing, and then you see everything actually cease and arise, it's just the nature of it, in our in other way. Okay. This is how the Sankara Upekara as uh, Sankara Upeka as a develop. In other words, uh, this is how our mind come to the realization of the Nibbana. Close to, I won't say, this is how you see the Dhamma. This is how you have the eyes. You have this mind become, you see every Sankara as an Upeka. Okay? Uh, this is why Sariputta actually, I'm going to tell another story. Sariputta, because of that, he become a Sotapanna. But then, how Sariputta become the Arham? <laughs> Anyone know the story? Um, I need to jump then. I forgot to say that in Chinese, the people are very difficult. Let me see. 
And maybe I will say that Chinese afterward. No, I just wonder. Uh, maybe I, I didn't put it here, but it's fine. Okay. You, you find that actually in the Majjhima Nikaya at number 74, <clears throat> it's called the Dikanaka, Dikanaka Sutta, I think. Dikanaka is uh, referred to, you know, even now you still have this kind of person in India, that person have a very long nail. You know, you do see the picture in the India, some ascetic. They, they, and in usually put it something they are more like the, um, how to say, the self-modification kind. They love torturing in a different way. And they have a non nail So one of the non nail uh, Brahmin, you know, uh, uh, came to see the Buddha. And during the conversation, firstly he claimed that he doesn't believe in anything. And that's what he doesn't believe in anything is become a truth to him, you know. I mean, you know, nowadays you have this kind of person too. They say, I don't believe in anything, I'm good, and I'm most powerful because I don't believe in anything, you know, right? You, you have these people. And this, not, uh, this uh, person, he, he, that's what he claimed to the Buddha. And um, after a certain conversation goes on, and he still claimed that, I don't believe in anything. But it's strange, if he doesn't believe in anything, why he want to go to see the Buddha too, you know? Usually, this is why you find something when you read the Buddha, you, you must understand there's a, they have something going on. And then later on, and then the Buddha, and when he say that, I guess the Buddha think this is a good time to tell him something. So that's why the Buddha replied to him, when you say that you don't believe in anything, it actually means you believe in something. You know, that means you believe in, you don't believe in anything, you know. You have the view, you have the dishti. Uh, and this kind of view, you, you think that you don't believe in anything, it not necessarily show that you are kind of like, it's not necessarily good, it's not necessarily it's a holy life. Because he's an ascetic, he definitely wanted to have a holy life, a good life, you know. So then that's why the Buddha pointed out the problem. Among that, then the Buddha did say one thing. Let me just read it for you. He said, uh, first, he said, this body is physical. It is made up of the four primary elements produced by mother and father, built up from the rice and porridge, in the other mean the food, right? Liable to impermanence, to wearing away, and erosion, in other words, to breaking up and destruction. You should see it as impermanent, as suffering, as disease, as an abscess, as a doubt, as misery, as an affliction, as alien, and as falling apart, as empty, as no self. Doing so, you will give up desire, affection, and subservient to this body. Anyway, the teaching is going on, going on, but I read that for you because we are going to talk that a little bit later uh, when we talk about, when we are going to address the meditation again. Now, after when he explained that to, this, to him, and then he did also say about there are three kinds of feelings. One is feeling is called the pleasant feelings, one is the painful feelings, one is the neutral feeling. And he said, at that time, when you feel a pleasant feeling, you don't feel a painful or neutral feeling. It looks very simple. You only feel a pleasant feeling. At that time, when you feel a painful feeling, you don't feel a pleasant or neutral feeling. You only feel a painful feeling. The same thing, you know, at the time when you feel a neutral feeling, you don't feel a pleasant or painful feeling. You only feel a neutral feeling. Please remember these words. Why he want to say it that way? It looks like very really redundant. No, he asked you, you must first know this is exactly is this feeling, not the other feeling. Okay. That has to be involved in a very great observation. 
Um, and then he say, at the time, uh, no, then he say, pleasant, painful, and neutral feelings are impermanent, conditioned, dependently originated, liable to end, vanish, fade away, and cease. Seeing this, a learned noble disciple grow disillusioned with pleasant, painful, and neutral feelings. Being disillusioned, desire, desires fade away. When the desire fades away, they will free. When they are free, they know they are free. They understand. Rebirth is end. The spiritual journey has been completed. What had to be done has to be done. There is no return to any state of existence. Then, a medicant or a monk whose mind is free like this doesn't side with any or fight with anyone. They speak the language of the world without misapprehending it. Okay, this is the moment when he finished explaining this to the uh, Dikanaka. Sariputta was fanging, use a fan. Maybe the weather is very hot, like two days ago. Fanging, because he was explaining to the Naka. And Sariputta was beside Fang, you know, the Buddha. After he hear this, he understood what they are. And this, that moment, he become Arha. Simply to say, how Sariputta become Arha is because understanding how the Vedana, the feeling itself, it should be understood in such a way he become arahant. Sali Buddha didn't become arahant through the body sensation, to through the body. It's through the observing of feeling. Okay. Okay now. But this is maybe think, oh this is maybe the commentary say that. No, the sutta say that. And the Chinese also exactly have the same record in Chinese translation, which is not come from the same text, okay? Uh, this is a long history. I need to really study Buddhism because the Buddha doesn't believe in one language. Anyway, Chinese translate from different version. Not only that, even if you have time, even the Sariputta actually, it, we have one of the what we call Theragada uh, saying that when the Sariputta, I'm going to read that later because when I instruct this method, and then the Sariputta was saying this that time, uh, Theragada is a kind of like Almost like when somebody attend Arahant, they will kind of like have something in their mind and they will almost, I mean, they are actually a very, very clever person. I mean, uh, they know how to use wording as well. So they kind of like kept it in the words, you know, that in those days. And that also, that Theragada you find, Sariputta mentioned about how the Vedana should understood that that's why you can be attend Arahantship. Also. Okay. okay. <clears throat> now, uh, this is back to what we just say. The activation of the fifth one means the wisdom that re regarding to the arising and ceasing. Okay, and the arising and ceasing, which is noble, and that is the one that will become nibedity, mean become the you could say you could say the penetration, simply the transcendent penetration. It becomes a penetration to the vulnerable truth. Okay. So this is what the Buddha understands as a wisdom. Now <clears throat> uh, I will give you one of the case, like just as we mentioned when the Sari Buddha first they, they hear the teaching, it's also about the arising and ceasing. He become the Sand as a first level sand, so called a stream enter. Okay, of course, be a stream enter. Usually, we think is relatively is not that difficult. The most most difficult is to become arahant. Okay, this is the reason why some of the Buddhist texts. Um, I would say a lot of Buddhist texts are for the end for that reason. Ha, for that reason, okay. Anyway. Uh, but then the Sariputta also, when it become Arahant, even though it's due to the contemplation on the feeling, however, 
it still must to do with the arising and ceasing also. Right? I, I read it just now. Right? Because he see the impermanence and he see the arising and ceasing. This is how then he start to see the dispassion of the feeling, you could say, and also the cut off the defilements, and then it become the complete, the one that will no, no more to be born again. Okay. This is why all the time the Buddhism always divide the banya, the wisdom, with the dis, able to discern arising and ceasing. Okay. Okay, let me just say that in Chinese, uh, uh, before we take the precepts, I didn't even say anything about Chinese, right? What did I say? Um, 我要讲的就是我们上次讲到说我们有五种尽情好我们所以我说如果你每次在禅修或者你每天一早起来如果你把这个记起来的话那么对你的整个人生跟修持都很重要 因为这是法义嘛，这个法义好，有这种法义的话，你就对你不管怎么样，你就开启你的智慧。好，第一个我们已经讲过，就是这个信啊，我们也解释有四种信，其实真的说起来，我们只能用到两种。好，除非你有证
洞察了。那这个洞察是指是一种涅，就是可以洞察而达到涅槃的这样子。那么这个就指慧。那后来我也讲到说，因为既然说慧的定义啊，这个不只是在这里了，每一个都是一样的定义。这个慧的定义既然是生跟灭的话，那么我也提到这舍利佛，当舍利佛。第一次正正出国的时候，但当然不是第一次，当然正出国的那个的时候，就是听到一个这个我们叫马胜比丘嘛，中文，在跟他讲一个寄送嘛，不是说诸法因缘生嘛，一从因缘灭嘛，对不对？好，我佛大沙门常作如是说。其实啊，没办法，我不要讲这个翻译，但反正就他就这么就是这个意思。那么所以你看，一切从缘生，又从缘灭，反正先不谈。就是就是简单说，就是就是要谈到生的灭，对啊，所以他是真的出国。那后来我也讲说，但是我们也知道，在另外一部经啊、哦，那么舍利佛是怎么成就阿罗汉国的？那么就是因为在一次里面，当我们一个禅爪的这个呃禅爪的这个仙人，呃就是修行人，然后应该么？就是一般仙人是指说他去修行的，禅爪的仙人，因为他认为说，呃他。有点意思，就暗示说他修得很不错，因为他的不错就是他什么都不信，嗯，对啊，啊、呃，他就是靠这个方法，什么都不信，好像来解决他一切的问题。但是我我也相信，如果一个人这么想，也可能真的可以解决一些问题了。好，但是但是那时候，当然这个讨论里面有很复杂的一个理论在里面，基本上复杂就是说，如果信这样会怎么样，不信这个又怎么样，就是这些讨论。到后来的时候呢，那么佛陀就告诉他怎么看待这个色身，因为佛陀就问他：“你有这个身体吗？那你怎么去看待？”简单讲，你不能说你什么都不信。言外之意有点说，难道你就不信有父亲母亲生你吗？是这个意思。好，就谈到这里。但是有个课题是这样：如果你只是相信由父亲母亲生你，实际上这个肯定也不能成为内观，也不能成为智慧啊！你不会因为这样看到生灭的。但是我们要了解，这个身体虽然是由父亲母亲生的，我们一定要透过这个吃东西来保持的，好。但是呢，这个身体还是要面对的，就是无常的，好。这无常里面就是会看到有生灭的，比如怎么样，就这样就就把这个呃，就是因为有看到有生灭的，啊，就是言说对身体的理解，并不是说什么都不信。但是也并不能只是仅限在说是父亲母亲生的，比如说我们一般人就只有仅限在这边，还没有更深的一种办法去洞察、关照到这个身体，不只是因为只有父亲母亲生，不只是因为我要靠吃菜来维持，有的人不是多了一点就靠吃来维持吗？这才是还有后面的，他其实他是有众缘而生的哦。比如说这一些，这个就是我们这边刚我提的。那么这里呢，最最主要，当然他讲了这个，最主要他后来那个时候佛陀就没有再解释别的，他就直接就解释这个受觉。在解释受觉的时候，也一样的道理，虽然有三种受，但是他非常讲得很清楚。这三种受，你要确认就是这个受，不是其他的受，啊，这个都有原因的。他这么说，他不会跟你随便乱讲这句话的。啊，意思就是说，你不能说我真的是乐受吗？不知道啊，我真的是苦受吗？啊，好像又乐又苦啊，这个就代表太差了，关照还不够好。反正你要能做得到非常清楚，就是乐受，就是苦受，就是不苦不乐受。这个时候呢，他在那里就谈到说，其实这种受都是一些诸行啊，那里面都是会变化，都是有生灭。所以从那里面，我这个我先不讲，因为我到时候会再说的。所以从那里面呢。主要这个时候，舍利佛因为那时候在跟佛陀散，就是散散散，是不是用扇子扇风吧？我怎么讲？是扇哈。然后，然后那个时候他听完了这个，他听到的时候，他就当然因为他们本来的定义都很好嘛。就像如果你们想一想，你们现在如果坐禅，对不对？我只要讲什么呢？容易回到你的那个禅修的境界。平常在里面在家里面可以吗？太难了。真的差别就这样，更不要讲这些。你要是这种大修行者，那更不用说。所以他一听完了，他立刻就进了那个境界里面。所以他就证了阿罗汉果，就是听到这个受觉
。那我顺便也提到，这个不只是因为这部经讲，当然注也这么说，还有另外一部经也这么讲，包括汉译也有这部这个这几个经，还有他当那个有一部经一部书叫做《长老颂》，长老颂有一个颂，当然是舍利佛讲的颂，里面也提到。这个受觉是该怎么灭的？对，当然他没有说我因为这样证阿罗汉果了。那么长老寄生一般都是记载了这些、这些、这些长老哈，就就当然这这里指长，这个那些，现在这个字长老被乱用了，所以我现在一讲长老，我就讲到就很尴尬。反正这个这些这些大师，哎呀，大师也是被乱用。好了，没关系，就是舍利佛像这些大修行者。的他本身证悟的时候，他们可能因为每个人证悟总是，呃，怎么说方法上有一点不一样嘛，你可以这么讲，所以它里面就会提到这个关于到受该要怎么去看待的问题。Okay. 好，我们先休息一下。好，呃，哎，不，不是，我们拿了那个八戒。然后 ，So now we can take the eight precepts now. Yes.